because we walk a bond, petty out yam, last a tally wong, a second, darn, and booze for t shirt up a school and say, Abba, came as a show Sure, sure. Come back, Anjan. I'm Nandi Jam. I'm Nakambango, left, right, left, right. And the child, I'm in a skipper and light tube. Right, I do be fearing the hour, Siskela, Simnandi, like Sakele, as a crandy. I conjoin thing at sea, stressful. Zawa fed. I go stress go to water for a cute exe pain goes up in luck. No, like he, I'm on Tumba Zanyazi. I said, no good man, young son, double. So. Oh, because I can't do so by Chomia. What's your question for our teacher in the studio? Hey, my question is that what is the difference between the difference in acid based theories? Thank you, Njibulu, for that question. Let's just repeat it for our viewers at home. He asked us what are the differences between the different acid base theories. Now, we are basically going to be looking at three different theories, and some of them do come from grade 10. So, that's how come I said if you're grade 10 and 11, you can still benefit from this lesson as well. Now, we're going to start off with the Lewis theory. Now, Lewis theory is actually talking about our Lewis structures. And if you can remember that, we're also known as my dot or cross structures. Now, what the Lewis structure specifically looked at is the number of valence electrons around the central atom. And those valence electrons, so just usually the electrons in the outermost energy level, are the electrons that will partake in a reaction. Now, a quick way of always finding the number of valence electrons, we're taking a look at the group number in which your element falls. So, apart from that, we'll take a look at the Lewis theory, we'll take a look at your Arrhenius theory, as well as taking a look at your lowry Bronsted theory. So those are the three theories that we're going to be discussing in today's lesson. So let's start off with that Lewis theory that talks about our Lewis diagrams. So for example, if we're going to be having nitrogen, nitrogen falls in group five, and we note that when we're going to place these five valence electrons then around the nitrogen, they will always be only a maximum of two at a side. So we're first going to place them one on each side and then we'll have four valence electrons. So we're going to place the fifth one then by pairing it up with the one at the top. Now we'll notice over here we're going to be having one, two, three electrons. That is in this case unbonded and this is where bonds can form. But whereas at the top these two electrons that's sitting next to each other is what we call a lone pair. Now, according to the Lewis theory, he said that a Lewis acid is a lone pair, and this is my lone pair, acceptor. Now, obviously, if the acid is the lone pair acceptor, the base will be the lone pair donator. Now, we're going to be taking a look at your date of covalent bonding, which is also known as your coordinate bonds, to show you again which one will be the Lewis acid and which one will be the Lewis base. So, let's take a look at our diagram over here. We're going to be having ammonia, which you can see is going to be having its five valence electrons from the nitrogen, and then there is three bonds, one each to every hydrogen over here. Now, this nitrogen has got a lone pair. It, in this case, will bond to a hydrogen ion. Now, note, though, that we do know that hydrogen will have one electron, but if it's losing or lost this electron, remember that the electron is negative, it will then be left with a positive charge. So that means whenever we do bond things, there must always be two electrons involved. But our hydrogen over here has lost its electron and can therefore not form a proper bond. That's how come the nitrogen in the ammonia will then be donating its lone pair to the hydrogen ion so that between the two of them, they will have two electrons which can form a bond. Good. Now, as we've said, in this case, the one that accepts the lone pair is going to be the acid and the one that donates the lone pair is the base. So for this specific example, we'll notice that the hydrogen ion was my lone pair acceptor and we notice that the base then, which is the nitrogen in the ammonia, which will be the lone pair donator. Okay, so that goes for the Lewis theories. Let's go and take a look at the Arrhenius theory. Now, the Arrhenius theory had a bit of a drawback because if we read through the Arrhenius theory for acids and bases, it talks about a watery or an aqueous solution, which means that my acids and my bases first have to dissolve in water before we will be able to identify them as an Arrhenius acid or Arrhenius base. So he said in this case that an acid will release hydrogen ions in an aqueous solution. Remember hydrogen ions, which is your hydrogen with a positive charge. And a base on the other hand will release hydroxide ions, which is your OH minus ions in an aqueous solution. So as we said, every time they talk about a watery aqueous solution. Now let's take a look at two examples. Here, first off is my acid. I'm going to be using hydrochloric acid. When I dissolve this in water, note though that this hydrochloric acid will break up into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Now, the hydrogen ion will then attach to the water to form the hydronium or the oxonium H3O plus ion. And on the other hand, then your chloride will be floating around there for free. 
If I take a look at my ammonia, which is a base, and when we dissolve this in water, note though that the water itself will basically split up into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Now this hydrogen ion from the water will now attach to the ammonia to form ammonium ion. And therefore we can see basically that the base is then releasing my hydroxide ions on this side. Okay, so that's how we were able to see then that acids when dissolved in water, which is your aqueous solutions, will be releasing hydrogen ions, which forms that hydronium ion. And your base on the other hand will be accepting this hydrogen ion and then form hydroxyl ions that will be released. But as we said, the drawback is the fact that it must be dissolved in water. Now many of our reactions do not end up dissolving in water and therefore we needed to take a look at another form of a theory that are actually helping us out in normal situations where we don't have water. Now this is where the Lowry Bronsted theory came in and he specifically stated that acid is going to be a proton donor and a base will be a proton acceptor. Now let's first take a look at what is this proton that they're referring to. If you can remember your atom still, and we're talking here about a neutral atom, that means equal amounts of positives and negatives. Right in the middle of the atom, you have a nucleus. And on the outer, outer side of this, you're going to have orbitals, which we will find our electrons basically in. And in the nucleus, there will only be protons, which are the positive particles, and neutrons. Now, we're specifically going to take a look at our hydrogen. Now, the shorthand notation for hydrogen is 1, 1. Remember that the top part indicates the relative atomic mass number, which is basically your protons plus your neutrons. And your bottom part indicates the atomic number, which is just the number of protons. So in order for us to find the number of neutrons, we'll take this mass number, subtract the atomic number from that, and then we'll end up with the number of neutrons. Now in this case, if I've got one and I minus one, we realize that there is no neutrons inside of my hydrogen atom. So that means we're only going to be having one proton, and if it's a neutral atom, there will be one electron to cancel out this positive. Now if it becomes a hydrogen ion, we said that means that it lost its negative electron, and the only thing that's now left in this atom is a positive proton particle. So when we are talking about a proton, we are actually referring to a hydrogen ion. Okay, so we, we said in this case an acid is a proton donor, that means a hydrogen ion, ion donator, and the base will be the proton acceptor, which means it will accept that hydrogen ion which the acid has then lost. So let's take a look at an acid and a base that will react in this case with each other, transferring that proton between them. So we'll notice here we've got the acid, which is a hydrochloric acid. It will then break up into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And this hydrogen ion will be donated to the NH3, which is your ammonia, to form ammonium ion on the other side. And your chloride ion will then be left alone. So this shows me that my HCl, which was donating the hydrogen ion, is then my acid. And on the other hand, my ammonia, which accepted this, will be my base. Okay, now let's quickly go and take a look then at some of my other theories, specifically taking a look at how the reactions between these things occur. So first off, you say take a look though, whenever we've got a proton transfer reaction, that means as the proton goes from the acid to the base, we call it a protolysis reaction, or otherwise known as protolytic reactions. So that's all got to do with when we have protons being transferred between substances. Now we're also going to take a quick look at conjugate acids and bases during this protolysis reactions. Now the word conjugate basically means the partner of. So we'll be having an acid and it will have a partner which we'll call a conjugate base and we'll have a base and that will also have a partner which we'll call the conjugate acids. So you'll notice that all partners is always made up of an acid and a base. The one will just be called the conjugate base or the conjugate acid. Now let's go and apply this to a specific example so that you can understand it maybe a little bit better. So first off here we're going to be having hydrochloric acid and water. Now we know that this hydrochloric acid is an acid that will be donating its hydrogen ion and when it's donated this hydrogen ion there will be left in this case a chloride ion. So these two are thus going to be the partners. On the other hand, if you take a look at water, it will be receiving this hydrogen ion to form, in this case, a hydronium ion. So therefore, we call these two partners. Because we know that this was the one that donated the hydrogen ion, we call this the acid. And because the water was the one that will be receiving it, we call it the base. Everything after the arrow will be called conjugate. Now I'm just abbreviating the word conjugate here because this one was partnered up with the base it will be called the conjugate acid and because this one partnered up with an acid it will be called the conjugate base. 
studio. Well, my question is, how do I do titrations calculations? Thank you for that question, Lindy. Let's quickly repeat it for our viewers at home. She asks us, how do I go about doing a titration calculation? Okay, now we first need to understand why do we even do titration calculations? And that's typically if we need to know either the concentration of an acid or a base. And then from the other side though, we need to know the acid or the base that we're using to titrate that concentration. So we're going to be using an acid and a base of one which we know the concentration and the other one we don't. So we're going to titrate the two so that we can find the unknown one's concentration. And we usually have that by titrating things together until they reach an end point okay so let's just quickly see what does an end point mean for us that's when an acid and a base have completely neutralized each other out so in our case that means that this is not an acidic or a basic specific substance anymore it's now a ph of seven that's when they have basically neutralized each other out okay now we're also going to now quickly just take a look at what happens during a titration calculation we will use a burette at the top and typically a conical or an erlenmeyer flask at the bottom now it just depends on how you do your titration in my case i've put in acid at the top and at the bottom i will be having base now to help me indicate my end point we're going to place in an indicator now what an indicator typically does is it's going to have different color changes so if it's in a base it will have one color if it's at the end point where the two have neutralized each other it will have a different color and then when the solution is then more acidic it's going to change to another color okay so we're going to be taking a look at what will be waiting rather until it changes its color for that neutral color change which is then in this case when we round about a pH of 7 if I use a strong acid and a strong base. Okay let's go and take a look at an example which we'll be using. We're going to be having sodium hydroxide base that's going to have a volume of 25 cubic centimeters and a concentration in this case of 0.75 mole per cubic decimeters. It will then be titrated over to 15 cubic centimeters of hydrochloric acid when it reached its end point. We now need to go and calculate the concentration of in this case the hydrochloric acid. So we have got the concentration of the base and the volume that we'll be using and we already know what volume of acid we'll need to use to neutralize the base but we don't know what the concentration of my specific acid will be. Now before we can actually do this calculation we would first need to write on a balanced equation. Now you must still remember from grade 11 that if I've got an acid and a metal it forms a salt and hydrogen gas. If I've got in this case an acid and a metal oxide or a metal hydroxide which is typically my bases I'll end up forming a salt and water and if I've got an acid and a metal carbonate it will form salt water and carbon dioxide gas now in this case I've got an acid and a metal hydroxide which means we're going to form salt and water so let's quickly write down that balanced equation so we've got our sodium hydroxide and we've got our hydrochloric acid as we said it's going to form a salt and water now in this case it did form sodium chloride which is your typical table salt but it doesn't always need to be sodium chloride that's going to form that's salt that forms is just meaning it comes from a metal and a non-metal and that could be anything depending on the base and the acid that you used. So you are going to make up the salt usually the first part of the salt coming from the first part of the base and the last part of this salt coming from the last part of the acid. So when you combine these two together you're going to be forming the salt which is in this case sodium which is a one plus charge and the chloride which is a one minus charge and then they'll end up cancelling each other out. Now the next part is you must make sure that it is a balanced equation because we are going to use the mole ratios in our calculation. So this is the formula that we're going to be using. You get this formula on the formula sheet. This N stands for the mole ratios in front of your balanced equation. C for concentration, V stands for volume and obviously A stands for acid and B stands for base. So if I'm going to punch in my values we'll note though that we're going to have one and one because my specific calculation had sodium with a one in the front plus I had a chloric acid also with a one in the front and then we'll just punch in the remaining part of our volumes and our concentration values to find 1,25 mole per cubic decimeter as my final answer.